Jerusalem, heavenly home, city of truth and grace. Oh, when shall we come to thee, city of sweet embrace? There shall the curse no more be known. God is seen upon his throne and there the lamb shall reign Jerusalem heavenly home city of truth and grace oh when shall we come to City of sweet embrace We shall behold the Savior's face And all His glory see And love in How sweet the sight shall be Jerusalem, heavenly home, city of truth and grace. Oh, when shall we come to the city of sweet? His perfect likeness we without end shall flow for the Lord your faith rewarding all his bounty shall be so still in undisturbed possession peace and righteousness shall
Welcome to the online worship service of Calvary Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina for this Sunday, June 14th. Uh, friends, before we talk about our online connection card, I want to acknowledge something with you today. Uh, this weekend marks the seven-year anniversary of the first time that I had the privilege of preaching here at Calvary as a candidate uh, for the pastoral call here at the church. And I just want to say uh, this is a little different than I would have envisioned celebrating that seventh anniversary with you, but I want you to know it is the joy and privilege of my life to be your pastor. I love you and, uh, and I miss you and look forward to gathering with you again soon. Well, friends, this is a time in our worship service we would uh, typically have a connection card to hand to you. And so today we want to I invite you to look for the online connection card. You can find that at calvarypca.org slash connect. If you're a guest with us today, we'd love to know you are there. Uh, if you would let us know of your presence with us today, any needs that you might have, as well as prayer requests, that's all available there on the online connection card. Uh, we'd also like you to take a moment, if you would, if you are watching with us on Facebook Live or on YouTube, if you would take a moment to like the video and to share it on those platforms, uh, that enables us to get into more homes and for you to have an opportunity to share the gospel in this way with your friends. Also, friends, I want to remind you that there are many resources that we have available on our website as you worship from home. You can find those resources first on the home page by clicking on the Live tab and then clicking on Worship from Home. You'll go to the Worship from Home page. There you'll find uh, prior worship services that we have recorded here at Calvary, as well as a variety of resources, uh, including, uh, including our worship guides and our children's worship guides, as we want to have uh, our children participating in worship with us as well. Well, friends, today we have the privilege of welcoming with us 
uh, someone who has been a longtime friend of Calvary Presbyterian Church, Eddie Brown. Eddie leads the ministry of Together in Grace Ministries, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that ministry as well as about Eddie later in the worship service. But we are gathered now to worship our great God together. And we are called into worship from the Psalms as we often are in our gatherings together. And today is no exception. We're going to be gathered to worship from Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. I will read the regular printing and invite you from wherever you are today to read the bold printing or the gold printing on your screen. Psalm 95, 6 and 7, the Lord calls us to worship in this way. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us us kneel kneel before before the Lord, our our Maker. For He is our God, and And we we are are the people people of His pasture and and the sheep of of His hand.
This is the time in our worship service where we bring our petitions to our great God. Before we do that, we want to invite you to send in your prayer requests to us here at Calvary. There are one of two ways that you would do that. Uh, you would either send in your prayer request to office at calvarypca.org by email. And if you would do that by Monday at noon, we'll make sure that those go out later in the day. Or you can use the online connection card that we mentioned earlier in the worship service, calvarypca.org slash connect. There's a place where you can put in your prayer requests. We would just ask you to do one thing for us. If you would specify whether you would like those prayer requests to go to myself and the other elders, or if you would like those to go to the entire congregation, uh, that'll help us know which email list to use. If you don't specify anything, we'll protect your confidentiality by sending it just to the pastor and the elders here at Calvary. Well, not only is this a time of prayer, but this is also a time in which we worship our great God through giving. If you call Calvary Presbyterian Church your church home, this is uh, the time and your opportunity to give to the Lord a portion of what he has given to us uh, for the work of, ex of ministry and expansion of the kingdom of God in this world. There are one of two ways that you can give. You can go to calvarypca.org slash giving, and you'll see the drop-down menu there, and you can give online in that way. Or you can give by sending in a check and sending it to Calvary PCA at 6520 Ray Road, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27613. Or you can send that that check in through your online bill pay service through your bank and just use the address that I mentioned a moment ago. Well, friends, uh, this is a time for us to pray our petitions to our Lord. And we have been helped over the last several months by the prayers of the Apostle Paul. The scriptures give us a reservoir of words for our prayers. And the Apostle Paul gives us many prayers through the scriptures for the church. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 19 is one of the, the greatest prayers, of, if, if you can have that, one of the greatest of prayers of the Apostle Paul for the church of Jesus Christ. It'll be up on the screen. I want to invite you where you are to read alongside with me as I read that prayer, and that will be a lead-in to our prayer together. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Father, you are the creator of all things. You are the creator of humanity, and you have made us, your people, in your image. Your truth and your light shines on all people. 
but the posture of our hearts is to believe the lie over the truth and to obscure your image. But every family in heaven and on earth and people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, Father, will give an account for their lives to you and to you alone. Father, we confess that we have often set ourselves up against one another. We have taken the mantle of judgment against one another, not trusting you to be the judge and king. We have not trusted you to be the gracious Father who through your Spirit has poured the love of Christ into our hearts. Father, we pray that in Christ Jesus you would break down the walls that divide us and you would bring us unity through Christ in our day. We do ask for those who may be quick to forget that you are a God whose love for your people is higher than the highest mountain, deeper than the depths of the sea, and more expansive than the universe itself. Father, may your love for us enliven our hearts today that we might be filled with the fullness of God. May that fullness of God in our lives pour out in compassion for our families, for our neighbors, for those who have different views about the world than we do. We ask that we may be filled with the mind and heart of Christ Jesus, who loves his enemies, even all the way to a cross. Father, we pray that, that your love would be the mark of this church as we move in the coming weeks toward regathering and in-person worship as a congregation. We pray that we would be patient with one another, that we would give space for those who are fearful, for those who are cautious, for those who are confused, those who desire for things to move more quickly. Father, may love be more important than our opinions, and may you be glorified in this church. Father, we pray for our friend Eddie Brown as he opens God's word for us today. We pray that you would give him the gift of worship as he preaches. We pray for your protection from the evil one for him. We pray for Eddie and for his wife Gail, that you would strengthen their marriage and encourage them in Christ Jesus. We pray for Eddie for his work with pastors from diverse backgrounds. And we pray, Father, that uh, through him you would display your reconciling grace and your love to many. For the glory of your name in Christ Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen. Well, friends, it is my delight and joy to welcome Eddie Brown to preach uh, here at Calvary today. And many of you have known Eddie for many years. Uh, Eddie and his wife Gail have been in vocational ministry together for, for several decades. And most recently, Eddie is, uh, is leading a ministry called Together in Grace Ministries. And your own pastor has been blessed by Eddie's ministry to pastors. This is what he does. Uh, the question that Eddie asks is, uh, we know who's pastoring the churches, but who is pastoring the pastors? And Eddie has, uh, has used this ministry as a platform to pastor many other pastors, not only here in Raleigh, but throughout North Carolina. And he pastors, a, he, he cares for a, a diverse uh, number of pastors, both black and white and of other ethnic groups as well. And Eddie when you meet him, he just exudes the love and grace of Jesus Christ. When I think of pastor, I think of Eddie Brown. And so it is my privilege to welcome Eddie today and friends from wherever you are. Uh, make room in your hearts and welcome Eddie as he opens up the word of God with us. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be with you at Calvary this morning and others who... Uh, Maybe with us this morning, I'm going to be uh, speaking from Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. So let me read. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. This uh, time we're in, I know we're kind of tired of talking about this time we're in, as the days have passed on the weeks, the weeks have passed on to months. Um, we've thought about the church. How will we keep our churches together? How will we worship? How will the technology work? How will we keep our witness to the world going? So we've thought about how will we, how will we do these things? But here we have the answer. Jesus. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. So for all time and all ages and all circumstances, it, for the church, here is a great promise of our Lord. I will build my church. So this morning, I just want to talk about two things with you. First, a question for everyone. And that question is, who is Jesus? So a question for everyone. And then secondly, a promise for the church. So we start with a question for everyone. There's one question in a sense to two groups, but the main question is the same. Who is Jesus? Verse 13 says, Jesus is speaking. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now this, this word people is anthropoi, and I won't bore you with Greek too much, but it literally could be translated, who are the humans saying I am? What does human wisdom, as it were, say who I am? People said and still say many things about Jesus. In Jesus' day, people were talking about him. There was a controversy around him. What do the disciples say? Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now, what's interesting about all these who are mentioned? They were all dead at this point. John the Baptist had been beheaded, and Herod himself, with his guilty conscience, seeing all the miracles that Jesus had done and all the uproar about him, said, it's John the Baptist. Come back from the dead. So people had lots of opinions concerning the question, who is Jesus? Today, people, the humans, have many opinions about who Jesus is. Muslims view him as one of the prophets. They call him Nabi Isa. Some of our Hindu friends have little pictures of Jesus, not that we know what Jesus looked like, but you know what I mean, pictures of Jesus on their mantles along with all their other, other idols, I guess just to be safe. In our mostly secular, modern culture, people have many ideas about Jesus too. Jesus is often called a great teacher or a man who taught us how to love and what love is. But I imagine if a lot of those people actually read the Gospels and what Jesus said, they might not think he's such a great teacher or they might wonder what kind of love is he talking about. Jesus pictures himself as a good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. But he also pictures himself as a judge who separates the sheep from the goats and says to those goats, I never knew you, depart from me. He tells us to love our enemies, but he speaks of those being cast into everlasting torment. You can't make a box that you can fit Jesus into. In every way, Jesus defies being pigeonholed. Human wisdom is inadequate to know Jesus, to know who he is. It's not enough on some shallow level to think that you think highly of Jesus. Jesus must be worshipped as Lord and God. Anything else is woefully inadequate. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon says, our Lord presupposes 
that his disciples would not follow the image, the spirit of the age, nor shape their views of him by what men thought. And so having asked what others thought, Jesus looks directly at his disciples and says that famous question, but who do you think I am? That really is a question, not just for those 12, but for all of us in all generations. Who do you say Jesus is? Well, the question was very directly put, and Peter very directly answers. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, this is an amazing confession that Peter makes. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. It goes against all human wisdom. Jesus is standing right by Peter. He's wearing his sandals. They've been walking in the dust. His feet are dirty. He sweats. He's hungry. He's tired. He's thirsty. He certainly has no palace, no trappings of greatness as the world would see it. The Son of Man, he says, has nowhere to lay his head. The religious leaders of the day called him Beelzebub, the devil himself. But by sovereign grace through faith, Peter is assured and convinced of who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter went far beyond tepid compliments of men about Jesus, which are no compliments at all, to declare that he is the Son of God. And it's upon this profession of faith as the gospel grows out that the church expands and grows into all the world. That this gospel, this good news of who Jesus is, is taken into all the world. And he builds his church. And if we don't take that, it isn't built. So Peter responds to the question. Now Jesus gives two statements in response to Peter's answer. First, he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. There's an exclamation point at the end of that. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Blessed are you. Happy are you, Peter. What a great blessing you have. You are like the man in Psalm 1. How blessed is the man. How happy is the man. Peter, this is a joyful pronouncement that you have made. Then you are blessed because the source of this blessing is heaven. That my Father in heaven, Jesus said, has revealed this to you, not flesh and blood, not human instinct. Jesus does not congratulate Peter as being more clever than other men. Peter had not crawled up into heaven to find the answer to the question, but heaven had come down to Peter and given him the answer. Peter made his profession by God's illuminating grace. Peter, who was once blind, now sees, and that is by grace alone. No, Jesus does not congratulate Peter, but tells him, He is blessed. And what a great blessing to know the Savior of the world. Let me ask you a question. Jesus asked the question, have you made this profession? Do you truly agree with Peter of Jesus that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Are you sure and convinced that that is who He is. Have you trusted in him? Do you rest in him alone for your salvation? Do you trust him alone to be your savior? No matter how foolish the world may say you are for believing such things. If you have, you are blessed with Peter. How blessed are you? 
You have passed from being naked before a holy God in your sin to being washed in the blood of Jesus to being clothed in his righteousness. You have passed from death to life. You have passed from curse to blessing. You have passed from being hounded by the law and its righteous requirements to being ever pursued by God's love and mercy. What a blessing. Then secondly, Jesus responds to Peter and says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, this is a troublesome passage for some people. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. There are probably as many interpretations as there are days of the year. But we certainly know something. We know that Peter is not head of the church. He's never been head of the church. That is a Jesus-sized issue. Only Jesus Christ alone is the head and Lord of the church. Not Peter, not me, not you. Jesus and Jesus alone. But Peter is an apostle. And the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And Peter was a chief apostle. He stood out among the twelve. So, in that sense, Peter had a part. The apostles, the others had a part. The prophets had a part. And you and I have a part. But the only true foundation on which we build is Jesus. Paul writes to the Corinthians and says this very simply and plainly. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. As to the question of Peter, Martin Luther said, when we believe, we are all Peter's. We are all living stones being built up into a spiritual house. So, a question for everyone. And now I promise, not for everyone, but for the church, the body of Christ, those who have put their trust in him. The promise is simple and wonderful. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now this promise is for the church with a capital C. The church in all time and for all people who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. The church around the world in every age. However, should not every individual church claim this promise as its own? Should not Calvary Church claim this promise as its own. You know, if someone laid a million dollars on this table and said, Eddie, that million dollars is yours. And I just looked at it. Wouldn't do me any good. I'd have to reach out and get it. And so this promise is beautiful. And we can admire it. We can put it in a museum and say, oh, isn't it great? Or we can reach out and grab it. And so the promise is for us. The promise is for my church. The promise is for your church. The promise is for all believers, for all churches in every age. If we believe the words of Jesus, that Jesus is building his church, not with the wisdom of the flesh and blood, but with the foolishness of preaching, the proclamation that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, by the Holy Spirit working in the word, working in the lives of believers, in our witness and word and deed of him to the world. So we are called to join Jesus in this building of the church. We have a part, but apart from him, he says, we can do nothing. To build the church, we need, we must have, Jesus. Someone said, Christ, we must remember, claims the work of building as his own. Whatever others may do, 
He is the supreme master builder. We see this in the book of Acts as the church grows. In Acts 2 we read, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Isn't that great? These, these believers, day by day, they were, they were worshiping. They were breaking bread together in their homes. They had fellowship. They had glad hearts. They had generous hearts as they shared with others. They were praising God, and they had favor with all the people. Now, what's the next sentence? And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. The words of Jesus where I will build my church. And here we see Jesus building his church. The Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. You know, if we look at our churches, are we seeing people saved day by day? week, month, year? Are we joining with Jesus in the building of his church? The promise is here. It's for us. And when you think about a church, it's not hard to see what a mess of church can be. <laughs> and what a mess the church, frankly, is in so many ways. But the Lord loves this mess. He says, not I will build your church, or I will build a church. He says, I will build my church. He claims it as his own. No, it's a mess. It's bound for glory because it's Jesus' church. The depth of Jesus' commitment to his church is seen in his cross to pour out his blood to suffer the wrath of God for her in her stead. We owe our lives to the church, to the Lord. The church owes its life to the Lord. Jesus says, I will build my church. He's not ashamed to call it my church. I heard a story, I don't know if it's true or not, about a man who was a pastor and his, his wife was an alcoholic. She, uh, she hid it pretty well, but not all the time. And one Sunday morning during his sermon, uh, she what, hadn't come to church that morning. And she came walking down the aisle, right in the middle of the church, right in front of everybody, clearly drunk. And the pastor stopped his sermon. He came down. He walked over to his drunk wife. He put his arms around her and said, this is my wife. And so Jesus says, this is my church. And he promises that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. All the legions of demons and devils unleashed against the church have no chance. No institution or scheme of man or hell can ever claim victory over the church of Jesus. His church will never fail, for he will never Think about Psalm 2, when the kings and rulers of the earth, they gather together to plot against the Lord and his Christ. And what does the Lord do? Does he nervously pace heaven? No. The scripture says he, he laughs. He doesn't laugh in derision or hatred, but he laughs because he's unperturbed. He remains seated 
on his throne. His throne is sure, and it is sure for his people in their stead. Even on that day when the scheming of men came together at its lowest point to nail Jesus to the cross, Jew and Gentile alike participating, God knew this was not defeat, but victory for the church. For the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail against the church of Jesus. The church of Jesus, which lives and grows by this profession, we share with Peter that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. And it is our faith in him that overcomes the world. John writes in his first letter, Who is it that overcomes the world? Except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Here is our shared victory with Jesus, to believe that he is the Son of God. Someone said hell has no power against faith. This is good news for you, Calvary Church. This is good news for all of us who believe in him, for all of us who would come to believe in him, that Jesus is building his church. Will you join with Jesus in that building of his church, no matter the cost. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, thank you for the promise, for the sureness that Jesus, he is your son, the son of the most high God, the Christ, the Lord and King of the church, who promises to build his church. Lord, we long to see people, friends and neighbors and family, people we do not yet know, come to this same profession of faith as Peter had. Because we are proclaiming that good and great news to others. So Jesus, will you build your church? And we pray in your name and for your fame. Amen.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.